recording find uh, suitable cylinders to record on. And sometimes you can get old moldy uh, brown wax cylinders. And if the mold isn't too bad, sometimes by just careful shaving, you can get a, a pretty nice cylinder. Um, but I always found that that was kind of hard to do. In fact, I was able to find dictaphone cylinders a lot easier than brown wax. So I used to get dictaphone cylinders. And when I was a kid, I would get them from a, a place on Young Street that lived nearby. And uh, they'd give me all the broken ones, you see. And so I thought, that's fine. But I can record. There's about two inches that's good on this one. I can get a, make a record on that. So I, I've got all kinds of records of my family back 50, 60 years ago. And they're kind of fun. They still play. Um, but then I thought, well, you know, here's all this wax. What are we going to do with that? So I found that you could melt the wax down. And uh, of course, I didn't know anything about doing these things. And eventually, I guess it would be in the early 1960s, I thought, well, I'm going to make a mold. And I'm going to see if I can cast blanks in this mold. Well, over the years, I've probably done I don't know, 60 or 70 cylinders in this mold. And it's a horrible looking thing. I'll leave it out here so that people can see it. But basically, what the mold is, is a, you, know, you get a derelict cylinder machine. There's the mandrel. And this thing is a very heavy chunk of steel that I've machined out. And I have drilled it and put a pin down the center to locate the mandrel in the center of it. And uh, you can see that it's been well used. And then I made up a... It sits on ball bearings down at the bottom here. This is the crucible for melting the wax. And it says uh, T on it. But anyway, you have to sort of read cupboards and things to find this stuff. But there's some wax in there that hasn't been melted for over the last 30 years maybe, but it'll still, still be okay. So you melt it in that and you pour the wax into here. The instructions are all here, by the way. I figure that trouble with most of the good stuff that we find, people never leave instructions behind of how you, how you use it. So I wrote these up as carefully as I could remember them all. And uh, so somebody can, you know, they, they don't have to reinvent the wheel, let's say. It took me about probably 20 years to figure out how to do it right. But I wasn't as smart as the guys at Edison, you know, the kids chemists. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's basically the mold. Uh, what I found was the most critical thing was to allow the wax to cool evenly. If one part of the cylinder tried to cool faster than another part, if you, you have to pull a mandrel out at a certain point because the wax is constantly shrinking as it cools. And if you leave it in too long, it, you, you're bang and it cracks. And then you start all over again. So you're lucky if you can make two in a day, maybe three. I think you might have got three one time. But it's real divorce material, so you have to be careful <laughs> when you're doing it. But I, I would say you, you could melt it on a hot plate, you know, and you could do it outside, so it would work okay. Uh, anyway, once the cylinder comes out of the mold, it is rough on the outside, and it has, and it, it's probably not quite the right size for going on the mandrel. So all, all you do there is you have a nice piece of really, really coarse sandpaper, and you put this around the mandrel. And you just, you know, put the cylinder in there and just turn it in that and you kind of ream it out. And uh, so over the years, I, there were two basic, um, um, I call them Mark I and Mark II. Here's, this is my Mark I version. It's, it's, it's like the Edison cylinders, you know, they start off flat top and then they get beveled later on. But if you, if you look, I'll leave these out where you can see them. If you look on the inside, you'll see that all I did was wrap the mandrel with, uh, wa uh, not wax paper, but uh, tin foil. And then I taped it with, with a piece of uh, scotch tape. Well, you can see the scotch tape mark, and it really weakens the cylinder at one point. 
If you want to get a picture of that, no, no. you can do it anytime. Anyway, come and have a look at that, that was Mark I, but by the time I got good at it, the Mark II version is much nicer. It has a beveled end on the thing, and the inside is very smooth. It's, it's lovely and clean on the inside. And uh, these are made out of melted down, broken dictaphone cylinders. So that's what we're going to use today to make the record. And I brought with me the two little brushes that came with my Class M electric machine. And, and this is a lovely little brush. It's a camel's hair brush, very, very soft. And it's for getting the swarf off the record. And I love this little thing here. It's very, very old. And it's just it's for cleaning the stylus if you get some wax on the stylus. Now, I found making records over the years that it was, I, I got really good results in the summertime. And that was because it, the wax was hotter. And of course, if you look at any of the old recording studios from the acoustical days, you'll see that the recording equipment was always inside its own little box. Even in the early, early 1890s ones, it, it, it was different in there. And it was because they heated that part. And I think they kept the temperatures around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, you know, uh, Madame Melba wouldn't like that. So uh, you wouldn't want her to be in a recording studio that was held to those temperatures and cost them more money to do it that way. So if you're going to do it, what, one way that you can heat up your cylinder, and I didn't, I didn't want to do that today because it just takes forever to make a record, you know. If you put the cylinder on the mandrel, and put a, either a heat lamp or just an ordinary lamp, have the mandrel turning so that what you're doing is you're not heating the cylinder unequally. You don't want one side of the cylinder to be soft and the other side to be you know, hard because it'll make a stupid sound really because it'll dig, the stylus will gouge. And, and the stylus is sort of like a potato peeler in a way. It's, it's actually a curved thing that goes along through the wax like that and, and scoops it out in, in little tiny sort of spirals. And uh, so the, the heat lamp will soften the cylinder equally. And the thing you have to remember when you're using a heat lamp is that you're expanding the cylinder. So that means that you have to make sure the cylinder is tight enough on the mandrel when you're making the record that the cylinder doesn't start working its way off because then you make a very strange sounding record and the grooves start to get closer and closer together and eventually it's, your recording is in one place and that's no good. But anyway, uh, if, if you're careful about it, um, you can do it, take the cylinder off immediately once you've recorded it because it's going to start to cool down and uh, just remember about expansion and contraction all the time and, and everything will be fine. So. Um, the question is, how do you play them back? Now, I have had extremely good luck at playing my early Class M North American wax cylinders. I don't play them on that machine because it is brutal on, on records. But what does work is, is a Model O reproducer, and I think most people in <coughs> cylinder machines are familiar with the Model O, and you can counterbalance the, the, the weight of the stylus by just putting an alligator clip out on the end of it. <coughs> yeah. It's easy when you're looking. There, it's like that. And then all you do <coughs> is you hang washers on it for weight. So that cuts it down a long way. If I put two washers on here, probably be no weight on there at all. Can, I don't know if you can see that, but it, it's, <coughs> it's pretty well zero weight. So that's the way to do it. And I, I, I play my Class M cylinders with this thing, and it, they sound absolutely wonderful because of the, the bigger diaphragm. Uh, they sound a lot better. They do sound different. They're not as glassy sounding. but you don't wear them out. And this is the key thing. Those early uh, reproducers, the standard uh, speaker and even the automatic, they're too, they're too heavy and they don't have enough 
flexibility. So you want to make sure that this can move back and forth. You need to have lots of easy flexibility on these things. And, uh, you know, there's way of ways of achieving that. Anyway, uh, I think we're ready to make a recording now, so we'll use the Mark I cylinder maybe here. Um, I, I do need a victim. And I'll move it. You know what? I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a nice try. Anyway. Not bad. It's got well. No. <laughs> well, it's one of every time. There's, there's a victim. There's a victim. You want to come? Yeah. Good for you. Now, tell me what you want to do. Do you want to sing, or are you going to speak into it, or what are you going to do? I don't know, really. I think I might speak into this thing. Okay. Well, you need to figure out before you start it up, because you might take a minute and a half to figure out what you're going to do. And then by that time, it's all over. Okay. <laughs> okay? So what you have to do is put your face in the horn, and you have to speak quite loudly, like this, into the horn. You see, you haven't got your face right in, but it's close. You want to try that? Okay. You could sing. You could yeah. sing, Paul. I've heard you sing. I've heard you sing opera. You could sing into it. Well, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to sing opera. Um, well, well, we'll record two things. Please don't push the table. We'll record you first. Don't no, push I want, the table. I want to just. Oh, that's, that's a oh sorry. Just have a dry run here. Okay. Okay. You can just do do something. And you're keeping, you see how close my hand is? Yeah. That's where I want your lips. Say the poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Yeah, yeah I could do that. I could do that. So do that. All right. Yeah. Now, I'm going to start it up, okay. and I'll give you the signal okay. when to start, okay? Okay, Jack, you did the You start the Are we going to do one? Yeah, I, yeah, I just waited for it. Oh, All right. Okay. All right. Got it? Right position. <laughs> Now, I usually hold up the, uh, the, the recording diaphragm and I move all this stuff to the left so there's no slop in it. Okay. Uh, because if you start the thing up, you can get funny noises. So are you ready? Yeah. I don't start until I give you the signal. Okay. Point two. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. It's got to be loud. Okay. was white as snow, and everywhere Mary went, the lamb was surely gone. Boy. <laughs> Is your mother in Molly Malone? <laughs> Molly cried, she's out. Is your father in Molly Malone? Molly sighed, he's out. Then can I come in by the fireside and sit there along with you? But she said with a smile, hold your wish for a while, cause the fire's out too. <laughs> hey. Do we have anybody else that would like to commit themselves to what? Or commit themselves? <laughs> I think you have somebody at the back. How about some Shakespeare? Yeah, some Shakespeare. Oh, no. yeah. And, that's business. and and you've got a good voice, or you resonate. Not as good as yours. No, no, it's going to be fine. You saw what we were. This is just before uh, Hector is dragged around the walls of Troy by Achilles and tells him it's kind of screwed up. <laughs> you say an introduction and date. An introduction and the date. Okay. Okay. A little behind the times. What I'm going to do at this stage. Hello. Okay. I'm sorry. It's in a low height, and I can't raise it or it'll change the pressure down on things. So you you want to sit down? In a chair. I can lower the horn. Oh, I'm fine. Or should I just? Yeah. Stand there, but keep your lips about here. Okay. You don't want too much escaping. You want to trap most of it. Give it a shot. Yeah, a little close. Yeah, okay. Okay, just do do a little bit so you can feel what it sound feels like. Is that you, Nelly Melba? Nelly? Hello? Hello? Need more loudness than that. Nelly! More diaphragm. 
Nelly, darling. That's better. Okay. Well, I'll tell you when to start. See, Hector, how the sun begins to set. How filthy night is crawling at your heels. And that's the end of Hector. There you go. The date, just in case you are interested, Hector, is your last day. It is the 24th of March, 19 AD. <laughs> now you can see the swarf on the cylinder. Do you see it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's very, very fine stuff. You can see the roof, you can see in between where I left on the stylus. Is that good stuff? Yeah. Can you see it down there? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, you brush it off. Oh, you like the clo close up. Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, that's a, that's a lot of wax. It is, yeah. <laughs> it would have been better had we had it had the cylinder warmer. It's not as good. Maybe I can pass it around, but don't put your fingers on it, okay? Just put your, <laughs> hold it in like that. I don't know if I can actually see the sound. Maybe we could play it before you pass it around. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, but it's going to take me a while to discombobulate this whole setup. We have to change horn. It's like my cylinders at home. Dave, do you take the pictures? Please. It's on. Oh. Uh, go down. No. no, I guess you bought it. Be careful. Be careful. The other thing I've discovered about making cylinders is that you have to use a rubber connection between either the recorder or the reproducer to play it back. And the more flexible the rubber is, the better. However, you lose your high frequencies if it's too long. So you want to limit the amount of cushy stuff you have in there. It needs to be hard material, okay? So um, that's why on the recording horn I am. I did, I did. That's why I used that elbow, that copper elbow, because I wanted it to be metal as much as possible. Because in order to do a 90 degree bend there, I would have had to have a piece of hose this long, and we would have lost a lot of the sound that way. So let's see where we're at now. Put this on here. I've. Uh of interest to you, again, this little where Paul's putting the alligator clip on there, I've duplicated that same process on my Ambrola A1. It's a two and four minute, um, and I wanted to play my, my wax cylinders. So I went through and actually measured the stylus weight from a standard speaker, from a Model C reproducer, and then the Model H reproducer, and the old. And basically Edison just kept increasing. It was seven grams, 14 grams, 21 grams. 
So I set up the washer, same thing as Paul has done, and measured my force of the stylus on my Adderall A1. And I put it down to seven grams. And I paid, played my brown wax cylinders perfectly. Not a mark on them. Yeah. I think as the cylinder material got harder, yeah. that they because that's what's driving everything. The they wanted more weight yeah. and more loudness. That's how they got the loud word. That's, that's right. Sorry, right. so is the cylinder still out there somewhere? Yeah. You can do this at home, folks. Yeah. <laughs> at least we have one of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we lost the sound. <laughs> 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 Well, they'll be able to see it. I can't wait to hear the light. Nobody recognizes their own voice. Well, I can't. Yeah. I, I don't think it's going to be a very I good tried doing it result. Well. Uh, uh, probably the temperature is not quite right. We'll make her loud. Yep. <laughs> The other thing you can do is use different speeds as well. Uh, we're using 160 here because you tend to get better sound with 160, but not necessarily. Yeah, what speed did you record at, Paul? 160. 160, okay. Yeah. Okay, here we go. That's good, huh? Anyway, thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Paul, do you find you get a better recording with a metal recording horn? Um, yeah. The I, commercially made ones back in the day were a fiber board, and I've got someone. one. Yeah. Um, I like your recording better. Well, a lot depends on the recording head. And I've got about 10 of them, and they're all different. Some of them are really record loud, but the high frequency isn't there. This one's good because you could recognize those voices. Yeah. You know? And that's why I like that one. And it's good for recording music or singers, you know. Yeah. But some of them, you just get very booming, well, not booming, bass, but the first is very bass heavy, but the treble is, isn't there. So, um, you just have to try to hold it. Yeah. But if you're going to use a metal horn, you notice how I had it bound? Yeah, what's yeah. that for? That's for dampening. It's to, okay. it's to get horn resonance. So. Oh. And it made a big difference. 
because Say it again, Paul. Um, well, why is it hope? If, if you listen to this and show them the horn. See that horn? That horn's got resonant. Ah! Yeah. Do you hear it? Going, you can hear it? Ah! It, it, it comes back. And that, the, 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 all, the trouble with horns is that they, they, they really love certain resonances and they respond to them. And if those resonances are in the music, then that part, you get a big spike, if you like, at a B flat or whatever it is that is in the music. Yeah. And by taping these, if you see any pictures of old recording studios with horns like this, this was the horn that was used. Uh, in fact, I took it off the picture of Jacques Urlis in 1915 or 16 in the Edison studio. It was one of the first pictures I ever came across of what a recording horn looked like. And, and so I very carefully put a protractor on it because it was a full side-on view of him standing, singing into this horn. And I thought, man, I can figure out what the <coughs> angle of this is. And then I had to go all the mathematics of how to make that column and all that. But anyway, it was fun to do, but I always found that that horn had resonances in it. And once I put this stuff on, that stopped it. It just does something to it. It just, it just confuses it all. But it's like, if you were to use that signet horn to record... Um, it wouldn't be as good. Because I'm sure people back in the day... Yeah, you can. around at home, they didn't yeah. go to the trouble of making a new yeah. horn. And do you know what, the first cylinders that I ever made, I didn't have any recording head, but I had a Model 50 Amarola, and the interesting thing about this was that if you tighten the little screw down that holds the weight, the pivot weight, it would jam it, and, and it wouldn't move sideways. And I thought, ha, let's see what happens. So I jammed it tight, and you could, you could make a little horn or, some, or speak just into the end of it, and you could make four-minute records. Well, of course, to play them back, that was difficult because I had to rig elastics because I didn't have any proper four-minute thing to play it on. So I just used the same reproducer and stylus, but I just put a lot of elastic bands around it so that it wouldn't dig into the record. And I've still got one or two of those records I made. I started in 1951, I think. I started that. So there's a lot of learning that goes into this, and it's just seat of the pants, all of it, you know. You just keep doing things, and you find out that they work. And I think that's what most of the recording companies did, too, you know. There was, I think this, what you do is you work, you, you invent something first, and then you figure out the science of why it works. I think that's probably what they've all done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, so anyway, have a look at this stuff, the mold and all that. It's kind of interesting, so. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to pick up from where Paul and I left off last year. It, uh, just to set the setting for you a little bit, remember Edison was taken out of the market for two months? He was taken out of the market from 1894 to 1896. It was a two-year period where Edison could not work on Edison's or phonographs. And that's what he had to do to get his copyrights and his patents back from Jesse Lippincott, who he sold them to for $500,000. He, he got them back, but it forced him out of the business for two years. So in that period, uh, Columbia took advantage of it. That's what got them going. So I have to back up. I can show you their machine. There's the Columbia machine that came out. That's what they brought out in 1895. So they're a year ahead of Edison again, which is nothing new. All this period, Columbia was always ahead of Edison. But Columbia, that's all they were doing was phonographs. They weren't doing their movies yet, and they weren't making motors and AC, DC. <coughs> So at this time, 1894 to 1896, you have to think, this is not the only thing Edison is involved with. He's fighting with Westinghouse and Tesla and all the other characters out there in the ACDC market and they're electrifying this, the state. So. so you have to give him a little bit of leeway here. So it isn't until 1896 that he finally gets back in the market and he has his first machine, the home phonograph. It, uh, 
started out at a suggested price of $40. That Columbia Bijou we were looking at was selling for 25. So immediately he had some competition and Edison had to lower the price of this machine to $30. So back in 1892, this is what Edison was making a lot of. These are these Edison brown blanks that, that he has. So this is one of the, the earliest ones that, that I have. There's <coughs> earlier brown wax cylinders we had out here. But this is when he's finally getting into the commercial market. A lot of people are buying uh, these Edison blank cylinders and they're using them on all sorts of machines and, and different recorders and reproducers. So at some point, Edison figures that out and I'll tell you later what he does to, to fix that problem. So when Edison gets back into the business, like I say, he's making blank brown wax cylinders, a little bit different than, than what Paul did, but very, very similar. But Edison had to sell cylinders with his machines. Now again, at that same time back there, there were other manufacturers who were making cylinders. We had one here last, uh, last year when we did this. It was from the Michigan Electric Company in Detroit. So this was a company, Leeds and Catlin, there in New York. So when Edison's first getting back into the market, he's actually <coughs> just buying their boxes and putting his label on them and shipping them out. So a lot of the first Edison cylinders that came out were actually manufactured and were done with these people. Now Edison may have sold them the blanks, I don't know the particulars, but those were a lot of his first cylinders that came out. So here's the Edison recording studio. I don't see any tape on theirs, Paul. <laughs> well, the one that's going over the piano is some spiral. All right, it does, yeah. you're right, yeah. there it is. So. Blake, so, yeah. Could we get the lid lowered on that? So that it's oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The cylinders marketed by the National Phonograph Company. So that's his new name now, the National Phonograph Company. From 1897 to 1902 were copies, individually transferred from molded master cylinders. Now, this is important. He is already making molded master cylinders. It's not that old method where somebody sits up in front and sings and then they make kind of graph copies of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> like Edison told all the market up there what they were doing and this is how you do it. That's not what Edison was doing. He was actually very, very early on using molded master cylinders. Then he would pantograph them. <laughs> but his first ones were molded. So the Edison factory log confirms that the company began electroplating master cylinders as early as December 15, 1897, and as a regular business by 1899. The resulting molds were used to produce multiple pantograph masters. Generally, three molds were produced and six molds for popular recording. So, do you know what I mean by pantograph? There. There's a pantograph machine. So, you can see. There's a master record, there's a playback stylus here, there's a linkage comes down here, and that's a cutting stylus. And they would run these at very fast speed, so they, and they would have many duplicate machines running. So that's how they were actually producing these records. It was hard to know they were molded masters to begin with. Was a duplicate as good as quality as a master? No. no. Good enough for those people. And there was, <laughs> I, I have some cylinders that actually say in the spoken announcement, duplicate. Do they? They say duplicate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Get back to my. Where was I? In 1897, the National Phonograph Company reported manufacturing 87,000. 690 brown wax records. That was 1897. 1896, he got back into the business. 1897, he really started to get back into the records. So he did uh, 88,000. 1898, one year later, he does 430,000. Five-fold increase. So the market's taking off now. So I, what I have up here is a slide. These are three example cylinder boxes. I don't have the cylinders in them. The three example cylinder boxes from the National Phonograph Company 
during the period of 1897 to 1899, and these were shipped to Toronto. The boxes were plain cardboard with a slip of paper inside the box identifying the type of music, the tune, the number, and the performers. That's interesting because we're going to see later on Edison forgets to give any credit to the performers. The tune number is also written on the cardboard box in case you misplaced the slip of paper, as many were. Edison brown wax cylinders between 1897 and 1892 showed no identifying marks. If the tune slip was misplaced, you had to rely on the spoken announcement at the start of each recording. The earliest records had a playing speed of 125 RPM, and that played three minutes of tune. Whereas Paul, you would, I asked you, you were doing 160 RPM? Yeah, but there was an intermediate speed of 144. For yeah, I'll, I'll get to okay. that. Yeah. Just, there's the slowest and there's the fastest. So the faster speed, of course, brings you down to the two minutes. I'm ahead of myself. Here's another key factor you have to remember now with these early round wax cylinders. The National Phonograph Company initially used a block system for classifying its releases and assigning catalog numbers. They're not matrix, they're not serial, they're catalog numbers that you see on these cylinders. The first block, beginning at number one, was reserved for the Edison band. And the second and largest block started at number 500 and was reserved for orchestral recording. So I'm going to say more about it later, but we'll go through some of these cylinders. So the music dealer here is Thomas Olexton from 197 Young Street. He had the presence of mind to stamp his name on the tune slip and attach the tune slip to the box. But the tune number as well is up here. Sorry, people looking over here? So it's tune number 74. So now the only way you're going to know about that song is you have to get the books, the discographies. And you go in, you look up number 74, and you see the title matches, and that's where you find out when it was actually recorded and released. Here's another box, again. It's a, this time it's the Peerless Orchestra, uh, slide number 20, 27? Oh no, that's the slide. What's the record number? 10. Yeah. That's all. That's the 10th. Uh, recording that was released. I wouldn't say the 10th recording released in that period, but in that sector where they, that block of recordings, that was the 10th one. Next one, the R.S. Williams Company. We all know R.S. Williams. They were a big distributor for Edison for many years. All hung with Edison forever and ever. So this is block number 2202. But see, it's released 1897. So you don't say, oh yeah, 2202, gee, that must be a late one. No, it's not. It was one of the very, very early recordings. It happened to be the song Old Lang Syne. So again, what happened was that re recording, that master, was released again, number 2202, in 1892. And again, it was released same, from the same master in 1907 on, uh, on the, the hard black box cylinders. So that's why when you see these catalog numbers, don't try and, and date the cylinder by that number. It's not going to help you. You have to use that number and get back to it this obviously. So here's one of the first boxes Edison finally comes out with. He's now going to start decorating up the world with his, <laughs> his pictures. Um, but what's missing? Do you, do you see what's missing on this box? Something Edison forgot. The picture of himself. He didn't put his face on this. So it didn't last long. <laughs> but it was out for a while. The other thing that's uh, missing on, on, on these old cylinders is the, the patent dates and the dealer dates and all the liability stuff. So it doesn't take him long. Uh, Six months later, he has his picture on there. Uh, he still doesn't quite have all the patents and the liability and, and the legal issues of, around that. But he's now uh, increased the speed. He goes from 125 up to 144 
RPM. I always like his logo, Echo All Over the World. He's going to stay here for a few more years, but eventually he, he's going to drop that. So as well now, he realized he needed a little bit more information. So he's got the information now. He has these stickers. Uh, there's a notice to the dealers concerning all the patents and the patent dates and the, the legal requirements for all the distributors. So those are little stickers. They get stuck on the bottom of the box. Now he's including a tune tag. So that's being uh, stuck inside. Most of the time you'll find, if you find one of these old boxes, people actually suck it to, to the outside of the box. I got this one by steaming it off the box. That's how I got it. So I was really interested to realize that when I got it off, here's all the important notice to and the instructions on how to use the cylinder. So, so it wasn't so good sticking it to the box. Up to 1900 now. Edison still got his picture, but now Edison is adding. He's adding his patent dates here now. So I should get over here. So this is cylinder number 404. Four thousand four. Four thousand four. Yeah. <laughs> so he's still working with his uh, with his block numbering system. The next cylinder that we're going to come up now. 1901, 1902, and now this is what you're going to be familiar with. This is what you're going to find with a lot of these <laughs> cylinders. Now he has all his patent dates up there. Now he drops the block numbering system. You can see, and he starts at 7100. So that goes back to about 1901. So now the, the sequen sequential numbers, they start meaning a little bit, but it still <coughs> doesn't mean that you can't date it by that. You can't say, oh yeah, it's this one, uh, 8459, it's a really early one. Well, the box was, but the cylinder could have come out later, you know. They had these masters. As, as people ordered from the catalogs, they would make them. They could make them like five years later. they put the same catalog number on there and ship it out. So it's not always a good indication of that number when the record was actually made. I'm going to skip this process. Uh, it's pretty technical. But it does look like Paul's mold, right? So I'll just say a few things. Yeah, do it. This, this, is, this is the process that, that Edison had for making his gold masters. So he had a canister. He had, my, I wish I could point it to him. So there's a mandrel here. It pivots and rotates on this shaft going up the middle. This white object, that's the white, <coughs> white cylinder. They would create a vacuum, suck all the air out. Then up here on the top, there's a magnet here that is running around, doing a circle around the top. It's turned, it's driven by this pulley up here. And this armature inside follows the magnet. So as that armature is following the magnet, the whole cylinder inside is turning. And, as it, and it turned at quite a fast speed. And then what they did, they took a battery and a high voltage, and these are, it's hard to see, but there's two thin strips of gold foil hanging here. And when they applied the voltage, and they had the cylinders printing, they would, they used the term vaporize. I don't know what that totally means, but it transferred the gold onto the wax cylinder. And that's how they got the gold passing. Then they would take that out of there, take the gold master, and then they would put it in a uh, copper, uh, copper plating, so they would actually dip it in, and they would uh, put about a 1 16th inch copper shell right up on top of the gold. So now they actually had sort of a little bit of a firm mold, still not strong, but they had something, and it's a negative of the original wax recording. Then they took that copper shell that they had and put it inside a large brass uh, casing that they, they would keep it in. And that, that was the master. And that one was never used for production. That one was used to make the submasters. And then they took the submasters and from the submasters they made more molds and those were the ones that went into production. How long would the mold last? 
I uh, recording. Yeah, with, I don't know with the with these harder ones, but the early ones, the original molds when they were doing all the pantographing, they lasted I think it was about a hundred to hundred and fifty recordings. Do you remember and, Paul? And, and they'd get damaged too. Yeah, they the get other thing. Yeah. yeah. They get dust in them and they ruin the grooves. But so. they always kept that first one, that first gold mask one. They kept that one. From that, they could always get lots more. This is the process, I won't go a lot into this one, where they just dip it down, the wax goes up, they pull it out of the mold, just big tanks of hot, hot wax. Then they would trim it down. And so here we are. Now we've gone to 160 RPM. We have the gold molded 1902 record. So these are the ones that we, you're gonna see a lot of. One of the things that's interesting in this, in this uh, this case in this record is he's got all his patent dates here and by the way when you're looking at these cylinder cases and you look up here and, the little, and you look at the patent dates they're all pretty close because it, they were changing a lot we're only up to 1901 1902 and you've seen how many <coughs> patent changes and how many boxes I've already gone through so that patent date on there is usually pretty close what's recognizable about this box is that it has an indent on the top and in the center, if you come up and look later at what I have up here at the front, there's a cardboard tube in the middle. So your wax cylinder, sorry, this is the black wax. This is the black wax now. So the black wax cylinder sat over top of that, that cardboard tube and the indent kept it, kept it in place. In 1902, again, the Here's just some examples here of the, the cylinders. 1902, if you found a black wax cylinder, all you would see on it, there, there's no indication of, of who it was or who the performer was. Thomas Edison had his little signature on one side, very faint, very hard to see. And then on the other side, it said patented. Then in 1904, now here's when things change. Now you start to see the beveled edge. But he still won't recognize the performers. All he's giving you is though it's a band or it's a quartet or or it's orchestra. So it's going to be a while yet before he finally puts a, the uh, performer's name on there. In 1905, Edison's having some more competition problems. I should have I've been skipping through this quite quickly, but. When that gold, ma that gold master Edison recording came out, he blew away the market. He just blew away Columbia, anybody else out there producing. The other thing that was interesting, he kept it totally secret. I don't know how he did it, but he surprised the whole market. And when it came out, uh, the people loved it. He also sold them uh, Model C reproducers. Made a, made a few extra bucks that way. But then competition did come in. Uh, in 1905, when Victor announced the Red Seal Records, Victor went out and hired world-class uh, performers. They paid for them, you know. Enrico Caruso was paid $1,000 for one recording, and Victor sold every record for a dollar a piece all over the world. So I think Victor did okay on that. So Edison had to come up with something to try and compete with these Red Seal Records. So this was Edison's uh, solution to it. He brought out this fancy gold and blue record label. Uh, he tried to hire some of the world's best performers, but he still had two major flaws. Uh, I think if you thought about it a little bit, you'd, the reason we play our Red Seal is we don't play this record. But one thing, the record still only plays for two minutes, and don't drop it. So that's why, although we had it for quite a while, it was never really, really popular. And they're hard to find. I mean, I've got two empty cases, and that's it. So now we go up to 1905, 1907. I should get back to my notes. I'll tell you some actual statistics here. This is his heyday. This is when he's, and the numbers that they, they claim, they, it just astounds me. In 1907, Edison was making as many as 110,000 two-minute black wax cylinders. 
hundred thousand year or what per day per day oh, per no. day oh. I can't even fathom that manufacturing that factory plant that does that but that's that's what historians have, have given me for that I find that really interesting but that was the heyday that's when everybody was buying them. but you know what's coming next so 1908 comes around now the records have changed again Edison has a since we're talking about two minute wax I'll, I'll go there first Edison doesn't do the gold molded process anymore now he's defined he's found a, a graphite that works just as well so he drops the world the word gold molded and he's doing a graphite molded master cylinder so he's dropped that word and he's just calling it an Edison record but it was interesting back here when they were doing this Edison record do you know what everybody called him same thing we call him today they go oh that's the two minute cylinder so that's how they were all marketed back then you had the two minute cylinder or you had the four minute cylinder same year 1908 this is the special that Edison brought out there was 10 in that series so they were trying to get the people to buy their four minute gearing trying to get the people to buy their you didn't have to but you could use the you could still use your model C reproducer on here um, but this is Edison trying because his competition was the records that are playing three minutes right so now he's up he's got up to a four minute so that's the reason that comes to market but you had to change your gearing on all your machines.